Hey, Al Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new ebook by longtime Future Freedom author Scott McPherson. Freedom and Security, the Second Amendment and the Right to Keep and Bear Arms. This is the definitive principled case in favor of gun rights and against gun control. America is exceptional. Here the people come first, and we refuse to allow the state a monopoly on firearms. Our liberty depends on it. Get Scott McPherson's Freedom and Security, the Second Amendment and the Right to Keep and Bear Arms on Kindle at Amazon.com today. Okay, y'all, introducing Jason Ditz. He is the news editor of antiwar.com. That's news.antiwar.com. Welcome back to the show, Jason. How are you doing? I'm doing good, Scott. How are you? I'm doing real good, man. I appreciate you joining us on the show today. And, um, boy, big news out of Nagoro Karabakh. And I guess people might be surprised to hear that there's such a place or that big news could possibly come from it, but this is pretty big. Top stories today on antiwar.com. First of all, where is Nagorno-Karabakh, and what are they fighting about? Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh is in the southern Caucasus. It's uh, former Soviet Union territory, sort of in the in the area around Georgia. It's in Azerbaijan, as, uh, both as far as uh, it uh, appears on a map and as far as the UN is concerned, it's part of Azerbaijan. Uh, but for the last 22 years, it's had an autonomous government that is unrecognized by any any nations, which is heavily backed by neighboring Armenia. Mm-hmm. And Armenia and Azerbaijan have been fighting over this territory for uh, basically the last century, uh, even during the during the Soviet era. There was more or less constant fighting in this area over, uh, you know, which which of the Soviet socialist republics it should be a part of. Uh, the Soviets made it an autonomous oblast within Azerbaijan to give it some measure of autonomy because it's ethnically a little more Armenian than uh, than Azeri. That didn't really work. Uh, they kept fighting over it. They offered a little more autonomy. That didn't work. Uh, and once once the Soviet Union collapsed, it just erupted into a complete all-out war for about three years, ending with a ceasefire that really didn't satisfy anybody. Well, and I guess you could see why. I remember being puzzled as a boy in school about well, how come West Berlin is wholly surrounded by East Germany? You know, it's a weird consequence of the war that the American and British occupied part of Berlin ended up being surrounded completely by the communist-dominated Eastern government and all of that. And then, you know, as you're explaining here, this is the result of a war, too, leading to a real sloppy situation. If people can imagine, you know, a Texas city wholly inside the borders of Louisiana – that would, never mind any ethnic differences or anything else. That'd probably lead to some fighting right there. <laughs> if, for whatever reason, you know, no, this, this town claims Texas, whatever. Um, right. and, the Arkansas and, uh, side of Texarkana tries to defect. There'd be, there'd be fights break out. So here we go. Um, <laughs> and now as you're saying, it is really, uh, um, to, to a great degree an ethnic and then even religious difference, unfortunately, huh? Oh, absolutely. The, uh, The 1991 to 94 war was heavily religious. Uh, Armenia is almost 100% Christian, uh, mostly Orthodox, heavily backed by Russia. Azerbaijan is overwhelmingly Muslim, mostly, mostly Shiite, but with a significant Sunni minority. And during that war, they recruited you know, Islamist groups from Chechnya to fight on their side. Uh, the Mujahideen from Afghanistan, which had just gotten done fighting the Soviets, came to help them fight the Armenians. And that there's really less of a risk of that sort of thing this time around, unless unless the war gets really out of hand. But but the real danger here would be Turkey getting involved in in a new war, because Turkey is a very close ally of. Azerbaijan, and, and of course, historically, and particularly in the modern era, Turkey doesn't care for Armenia all that much. And Armenia is between Azerbaijan and Turkey, right? Right. Yeah. And and Armenia is constantly pushing for uh, 
resolutions at the UN and around the world recognizing the Turkish genocide of Armenians during World War One, which Turkey insists didn't happen, and that's a big part of why they don't care for Armenia. And uh helps to keep tensions high. Right. There's there is just constant tension between those two countries. Mm. All right. Now, so what happened over the weekend here? Well, it re- it really sort of started on Wednesday when uh the Azerbaijani president uh was visiting Washington DC and he visited the State Department talked with Secretary of State Kerry, who told him this Nagorno-Karabakh thing can't just be unresolved forever. We need to come up with a ultimate resolution soon. And within the next 48 hours, there was fighting. Uh, there was... Uh, it's not entirely clear who started it, both sides as is so often the case and since the other side started it. Azerbaijan says there was some shelling out of Nagorno-Karabakh, which killed a couple of people on the on the border. Uh, Azerbaijani uh, helicopters attacked some sites within there, killing some Armenian troops. And it very quickly escalated into full-scale fighting over the weekend. All right, now, so... Now, I guess you're saying, I think you, you write in the article that Kerry made it clear, at least publicly, that he meant negotiate and, and didn't say, hey, start a war. But are you suspicious that actually what he did say was go ahead and start a war here? Or they just decided, you know, maybe uh, in a resentful kind of way, if the Americans are going to push us around and tell us to resolve the conflict, we'll resolve it all right. Or we don't really know, I guess. Well, we don't really know. I, I suspect that Kerry didn't tell them to start a war, though. I, I suspect he really did say, you know, negotiate. But there isn't a good solution that's going to be negotiated out of this. It's going to satisfy anybody. The Soviet Union tried negotiated settlements of this uh, situation for virtually a whole century. And... The, uh, it's territory that belongs to Azerbaijan and and a largely Armenian population, which would rather be part of Armenia or an independent republic. And there there isn't a middle ground that's going to placate everybody. So I think they figured if the U.S. is going to start pushing for a resolution, that the fastest way would be to try to just take it militarily. Yeah. Man, that's really something, too, you know, looking at the map that you have uh, posted in your news stories here. Uh, that is one funky border, even if they tried to negotiate it and say, okay, we're going to, you know, cut a path through here. Obviously, it looks small on the map, but we're talking about a large amount of land if they created, I don't know what you call a national easement, but something like that in order to to connect Armenia to this territory, then... You know, I guess it doesn't necessarily cut off the rest of Azerbaijan, but you're talking about a, a very strange national border with this much of one country kind of jutting into another there, even if they well, could it, connect them. So it, it you can see why. Yeah. It already kind of is a, an, an odd border situation because you've got Azerbaijani territory on both sides of Armenia in the first place. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. There's a bit of Azerbaijan in Armenia just as well as there's a bit of Armenia inside Azerbaijan. Right. Well, maybe they and, need to just dissolve their states entirely and let the people be free, and then it won't matter. Right. And and a big, a big recent source of tension over that, because it, it's been in this state of uh, ceasefire for 22 years, uh, but a big source of tension really has been the Syrian civil war. Uh, there, there were was a, I mean, not an enormous population, but a significant population of Armenians living in Syria who fled the country when the war broke out, and Armenia took them in, but very quickly started settling them in Nagorno-Karabakh uh-huh. with an idea of, well, this is going to make it even more 
majority Armenian. Azerbaijan clearly not happy with that situation, right. but it, it seems like up until now they didn't they didn't feel like they could do anything about it except for complain to the UN. All right, now as far as um, Russia's role in this, it's interesting. I mean, whether deliberately or not, America it seems has provoked this Shiite country into attacking this Christian one. And Russia's on the side of the Christians. The Americans are on the side of the Muslims. Not that I think that, you know, it, those lines should be the dividing lines or that the USA should be on either of those. It's just ironical to me, kind of, in a way, the way they keep doing that. Uh, just like in Syria. Uh, just like in Iraq. Uh, but anyway, um, so the, but the Russians have, uh, their own tensions with the Turks and, They've got some kind of relationship, you know, I, I wouldn't know how to describe it at all. Uh, I guess a closer one with Armenia, but they have a relationship with Azerbaijan as well. And, you know, what can you tell us about Russia's role in this and maybe what good they could do in, in bringing a peace or, or what harm they could cause in making it worse? I think their interest in the uh, previous war was in preventing Armenia from getting completely overrun by Azerbaijan, which had a significantly stronger military at the time and, and still does to some extent. Uh, not That's not to say that Russia is an enemy of Azerbaijan. They sell them quite a few weapons, too, and they're on decent terms. But Russia's stationed about 5,000 troops in Armenia, and their thought on that is mostly to keep Turkey out. So this has sort of been a hedge against uh, Turkey coming across the border during one of their many, many disputes with Armenia. But it also virtually guarantees that if this war escalates much further, Russia is going to fairly quickly find itself involved on the side of Armenia. All right, now uh, let me ask you some questions about Yemen for a minute, can I? Sure. All right. So, uh, Mansur Hadi, the guy that uh, Hillary Clinton kicked out the last dictator and replaced him with this guy in the one man election of 2012, correct? Uh, right. Ali Abdullah Saleh was the predecessor. Right. He'd, he'd been the dictator for about 30 years. Okay. So, uh, Hillary regime changed him. Uh, skip a few. The Houthis. Invaded, took the capital city. The Saudis and the USA launched a war against them a year ago. And now you have this uh, article here at, again, news.antiwar.com. Pro-Saudi Yemen president sacks prime minister. And this is, I guess, about what's sort of a government in exile, but I guess in exile at the coast now. They were kicked completely out of the country. Now they're back in the port town of Aden, and they're setting up kind of a pseudo-capital there. Is that what this is about? Right. And and to some extent, they're still in exile. A lot of their operations are still run out of Riyadh, but, but they have some offices in Aden that get bombed by ISIS or Al-Qaeda every once in a while. And then, so what's the deal with this? Is it even meaningful about the their prime ministership and, and presidency here, or is this just a bunch of kooks in a hotel like they have in in uh, Kenya or in Ethiopia or in Tunisia or where, right, wherever just, America hosts fake friends of whoever suck puppet government somewhere? Right. To some extent, it's that. It's just a shuffling of the leadership of a government that's largely powerless, but uh, the the thing I found most interesting out of this was uh, the new vice president is uh, General Ali Mohsen Amar, who was a major part in the Arab Spring revolt against Saleh, hmm. which led to Hadi's installation in that probably worst sham of an election in... Uh, Probably in the history of the world. I mean, that that election was incredible. It, it was one candidate. There was no option on the ballot except to vote for him. There wasn't even, like, a no-vote option. 
I, even the Soviet Union, had, uh, there was always sort of a, oh, I'm not going to vote for that guy option. Right, three or four different members of the Communist Party to choose from. <laughs> right, there, there are four members who ultimately didn't matter. Uh, this was just one guy's name on a piece of paper. And well, and it's fun to put it in Google it. Images, too, and you can see the ballot with the his little crest and his face there. You know, in the little, here's a place to put your check mark. <laughs> There's only one little square to check. Right, and he somehow still only got like 98% of the vote. I don't know how those other 2% managed. <laughs> They're writing in Ron vote. Paul at the bottom. <laughs> All right, he was, so. He was elected to a two year term in, in February of 2012. Mm-hmm. And if you do some, some pretty quick math, you realize it's 2016, so it's over four years after that. Yeah. And he's been fully run out of the country and out of power what a year and a couple of months ago at least right right he he got his since then i mean his party to extend his term in office one year which would have taken him into february of 2015 but he resigned in january of 2015 after the houthis took the capital and started pushing him to approve a constitution and new elections this would be such a great talking point for bernie sanders or for donald trump that you know, you could just say it in a sentence or two, you know. Look what she did in Libya. She overthrew the government and led right to a terrible war. And it's kind of shorthand, but it's certainly beyond dispute. <laughs> you know what I mean? It Especially is. Especially when you have the former dictator allied with the guys who are ruling the capital city now. Seems like right. good and, politics. And he, but... was, he was a former dictator that was closely allied to the U.S. And now Hadi is the... Uh, dictator, because you can't, certainly can't say he was a really elected president that's allied with the U.S. Yep. And he's not in power, but the U.S. is heavily backing a war trying to reinstall him. Oh. Both two years after his term ended and a year after he resigned. Right, and as bad as Sala was, he was worse because of all the American support is what really led up to the the Arab Spring is all the money and weapons they were giving him. He was using to launch repeated wars against the Houthis and losing and building them up. And, and, right, yeah, uh, and giving carte blanche to the CIA to bomb Al-Qaeda and multiply them by factors of 10 each time. And that was really the, uh, the only thing that was keeping uh, the Sala government active at all in these domestic wars of theirs was U.S. aid, because even with all that American aid, the Yemeni military couldn't stand up to most of the tribes. They they would pick a fight with uh, some tribal faction in the cent- center of the country. Tribal faction would blow up the oil pipeline and, and chase them out, and that would be it. And we saw this happen time and again, but they would keep getting a little more weaponry from the U.S. and try it again. Where, in the absence of all that U.S. aid, I think they would just accept the fact that, well, our power doesn't extend tremendously outside of the capital city. Yep, there you go. It's the whole damn terror war, just in a nutshell. We've got the same thing over and over again. Tell the same story about Somalia or Libya or wherever, with slight variations. But, uh, whole thing. Uh, terror war writ small, I guess. All right, and now, and so speaking of uh, Libya, I wanted to ask you about that too, because <laughs> I don't know if it was as funny to you anymore, you know, as it still is to me. But <laughs> the thing in the New York Times, well, what was really funny was the tweet. I don't know if you saw the tweet, but the New York Times tweeted out, they're like, oh, the, the uh, unity government makes major gains in Libya. And then you click the link and it's, they got off the boat and they went a few blocks into the capital city before they turned tail and ran away again. Something like that. <laughs> and they're the unity government in so much, insofar as they call themselves that, but they do not include either of the other two governments in their organization at all. So they're not really the unity of anything. But anyway, um, just such hopefulness in the tweet and in the headline at the New York Times. That uh, an- another one of these governments in exile is is really going to work this time. But so I guess the question for you then is, 
Do you think they really are trying it, though? I mean, pair it up with the Washington Post here. Another Western intervention in Libya looms. We know there's some special forces there. Are they going to really try to go nation build and install a new, you know, foreign European, UN, U.S. backed government there? I think they are. I, I think they feel like they have to because they want to invade Libya to fight ISIS. And in the absence of a government with at least some semblance of uh, legitimacy and and authority over the country, they're not going to have anybody that's uh, backing it within Libya. So I think for them, having this uh, government in exile that had been stuck in Tunisia for months, sneak in on a boat and hide out in a naval base and then um, take a few steps out one day before getting chased back into the naval base. I think that's uh, being seen by a lot of Western nations as this is our golden opportunity. These are the guys that we could prop up. Man, but so that means then that they really have no one to ne- to uh, negotiate with in the other two governments? I mean, it seems like that would be step one, would be getting some kind of tacit agreement from the other two governments that they're willing to try to work with the new thing. Otherwise, just on the face of it, it's a huge false start, right? Right, but but they really don't have anybody to work with in either of the other two governments. The uh, Tripoli backed government, uh, Tripoli based government. Well, I guess we should say the other Tripoli based government now. The parliament there has made clear they don't want Western intervention. They see it as a slippery slope to an occupation and something that would just bolster uh, ISIS. Well, the uh, Tobruk-based parliament, which is the other UN-backed government in Libya, is very close to Egypt, and Egypt has made clear they don't want to see a Western intervention because they see that as... uh, similarly likely to help ISIS. Yeah. Well, and of course, that's right. <laughs> damned if you do, damned if you don't, damned because you did in the first place. Back when we warned them not to, Jason, you and me right here, you know, five years ago, saying, boy, I guess that means they're going to have to try to occupy the place and build up a government and have a war with a bunch of suicide terrorists. And the only good news is that it's taken this long to really get going. They thought they could ignore it. But uh, now it's too late. Now it's time for them to start back up again, it looks like here. And, of course, they got politics, man. Hillary Clinton's running. And at least they got to say that they're fixing it. They're trying. They're, it's a work in progress or something instead of, boy, look at what a mess she left behind, which is, a, you know, not very good politics. I, that probably right. has and, as and much Hillary's, to do with this new war as anything else. It's her Hillary run for office right now. continued to defend the, the war in Libya the 2011 uh, regime change that NATO imposed in in Libya as uh, a pretty good deal. It didn't cost a lot of money. It uh, no U.S. troops were killed, so it wasn't that bad a thing. Even though it, you know, destroyed Libya and turned it into a breeding ground for ISIS. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and no one killed. Oops, except the CIA guys and their mercs and the ambassador. <laughs> forgot about that part for a minute right there. that was a that was a little little after the war had supposedly ended so right. and and all the civilians who were rounded up and massacred by the libyan islamic fighting group veterans of iraq war ii uh yeah never mind their lives they never counted in the first place and you know i'm not sure if you ever saw this one or not but um in one of these debates and real clear politics had a good write-up on this. In one of these debates, she said, hey, we're still in Korea, we're still in Japan, we're still in Germany forever, and we're always going to be. And that's the same thing with Libya. We just need to go in there and in, and just stay until everything is great and then keep staying. And that was her answer to Libya, was to, you know, to invoke the permanent occupation of Japan and Korea. So... You know, right. I mean, and, and exactly what John McCain is, would have said, exactly what Max Boot says in Commentary Magazine. The incredible thing to me is countries like Japan clearly don't even want the U.S. there. I mean, the, the fight over Okinawa is ridiculous. I mean, U.S. bases take over a good chunk of that island. 
there there are always these plans to try to move the bases to less densely populated parts of the island, but they always want Japan to pay for it. You've got major Japanese cities that are just stuck with uh, stuck with U.S. military bases right in the middle of them. Well, and the Okinawans are conquered people anyway. I mean, they're not even really Japanese. They don't consider themselves to be Japanese, but they're conquered by the Japanese before us. That's why it's so easy for the Japanese government. It'd be like, you know, America letting the Chinese have a base on Puerto Rico, because who cares? Screw them. They're not, you know what I mean? They're, right. we, we own their island, but that doesn't make them us. That kind of attitude. You right. Know? They can't exactly elect a new president. Uh, yeah, they certainly can't. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, listen, man, uh, thanks for coming on to talk about all the bad news with us, Jason. I really appreciate it, dude. Sure. Thanks for having me. All right, y'all, that's the great Jason Ditz all day, every day long, man. I'm telling you, uh, news.antiwar.com on all of this stuff, news.antiwar.com. Hey, all Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new ebook by longtime future freedom author Scott McPherson, Freedom and Security, the Second Amendment and the Right to Keep and Bear Arms. This is the definitive principled case in favor of gun rights and against gun control. America is exceptional. Here the people come first, and we refuse to allow the state a monopoly on firearms. Our liberty depends on it. Get Scott McPherson's Freedom and Security, the Second Amendment and the Right to Keep and Bear Arms on Kindle at Amazon.com today. Hey, Al Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State. In The War State, Swanson examines how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy both expanded and fought to limit the rise of the new national security state after World War II. If this nation is ever to live up to its creed of liberty and prosperity for everyone, we are going to have to abolish the empire. Know your enemy. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. It's available at your local bookstore or at Amazon.com in Kindle or in paperback. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org or thewarstate.com. Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for WallStreetWindow.com. Mike Swanson knows his stuff. He made a killing running his own hedge fund and always gets out of the stock market before the government-generated bubbles pop, which is, by the way, what he's doing right now, selling all his stocks and betting on gold and commodities. Sign up at WallStreetWindow.com and get real-time updates from Mike on all his market moves. It's hard to know how to protect your savings and earn a good return in an economy like this. Mike Swanson can help. Follow along on paper and see for yourself. WallStreetWindow.com.